Good morning and welcome to Morning Scoop for Friday, December 3rd. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The game against Michigan in 358 days. On yesterday's show, we talked about how the Ohio State offense kind of abandoned the run, was kind of predictable, failed to capitalize on obvious opportunities to run tempo when they lost to Michigan. Today, we're talking about the defensive performance, so things are not going to be nearly that upbeat. My guest once again is Buckeye Scoop's X's and O's guru, Ross Fulton. Ross, Let's start with the question I've seen a bunch this week. Why was Ohio State playing two linebackers so much when Michigan, it was in very predictable run situations? Okay. So a few things on this. <laughs> Number one, so Michigan, right, they still are playing a lot of 11 personnel. So you still have to match. Like even if Michigan is running the football, they're running RPOs off of it. So you still have to guard the RPO or else you're, you're, going to just give those up instead second i mean that's the structure of the defense and so it's hard right i mean i i think you can reasonably argue that like craig young for instance they played him against michigan state when michigan state went two tight ends they put him in the first series against michigan when michigan went two tight ends i'm not entirely sure what happened i, I have some ideas but they did not put craig young in again after that first series instead they played either – they played basically Marcus Williamson when, Ohio, when Michigan had three wide receivers or they bring in Latham Ransom when they were too tight. And, you know, part of that, again, gets to this, like, field boundary issue where, like, they put that position to the field. And so with what Michigan did, was doing, that guy was, like, out in space anyways. And that wasn't so much where the problem was coming. So I think there's a reasonable argument that they should have gotten Craig Young more reps earlier in the year. They should have had a more diversified system so that guy wasn't always out there. Um, but, like, you know, you can't just be like, hey, let's throw Tommy Eichenberg at that position because it's, like, an entirely different position. And just because they have a linebacker next to their name, that's just like saying, like, let's play Zach Harrison at nose guard. You know, it's the same concept. Like, he hasn't played the position. He doesn't have the body type for the position. So I still don't really think that gets to, like, the heart of the issues. They've also had injuries there and, some and they've had a lot of injuries and it's, it's the, <laughs> the heart of the issue at some level is like, it's the converse of 2019 where like in 2019, which was a much better defense, they still sat in base defense all year. Then they got to the Clemson game and they needed a nickel back and they suddenly had Josh Proctor playing like the most important snaps of the year. And he had like 40 snaps all season. So in the last three years, whether it's half late Combs, Barnes, like they continue to, they continue to substitute willy nilly, like getting guys in, but like they don't have situational enough situational packages, which just gets to the point. Like they just don't have enough defense. Period. So this is going to be similar to a question I asked you on yesterday's show, but you know, in your mind, was Ohio State's defensive front getting blown off the ball, or was Michigan doing some clever schematic stuff to open up holes in the run game? Why why were they able to run the ball against Ohio State so much better than pretty much anyone else since Oregon? Some of both. And so there's a, uh, there's a commonality right there, right? So Joe Moorhead is the Oregon offensive coordinator. Josh Gaddis is, is a Joe Moorhead protege. And they took advantage of a lot of the same concepts, basically stretching Ohio State, running it at the boundary or the short side of the field while stretching them to the, to the wide side of the field. And Ohio State still cannot, does not put enough numbers into the boundary and or put their corners and, and run support there. And so that's part of it. Like they're just, you're not going to look good defensively if you're down a man trying to stop the run at all times. Um, you know, I, I would not say that like the defensive line other than Haskell Garrett, which is like a whole another issue why he's playing like 30 snaps in the biggest game of the year. Like, the, you know, Michigan wasn't pulling Aiden Hutchinson off the field for half the plays. Um, you know, they weren't, taking on double teams, like at, at the very least, if you're getting double teamed and you're getting pushed back, like just create a pile and just try to like, you know, there's things to do. Um, but like at the end of the day, it's just, it's going to be hard to play defense when you're constantly getting outnumbered. You wrote about how Ohio state tried to use Ronnie Hickman and run support, but that Michigan was able to put him in conflict a lot really, and then kind of yeah. neutralize what they were trying to do. So what did Michigan do to make that happen? Yeah, and so, I mean, one thing that Matt Barnes did to try to help the defense, and it did, which is, like, ask Ronnie Hickman to do a lot. And so, 
they wanted, you know, he basically had to fill the role of three guys. And so when they went to, you know, they installed cover four in the season. When you're installing something this season, you can only do so many things with it. And like one thing they did was when when a team has trips or three wide receivers to the far side of the field, Hickman is the boundary safety was generally in what's called poach. And so if the inside receiver and trips releases into the pass play, like Hickman is responsible for him vertically. So, but he also, they also really like Ronnie Hickman. The way they tried to solve a lot of this boundary run game issues is to have him insert himself aggressively as a run defender. And so what Michigan did a lot was they played trips and they'd run an RPO to the far side of the field. So Hickman had to pause to honor his, of his past responsibility and like you know that that gave enough time for the run play to come downhill and pull him out of position so you know and then it can like you know then if Ohio State went to cover one same thing they like send the tight end on an RPO slide and Hickman you know there's one big big run play where you can see Hickman go flying out of the picture because but he has to do that because otherwise like tight end would be wide open and they'd throw the RPO and so again just the lack of you know, I can compare it. Michigan through so much different defense at Ohio State. And like, you know, there's downsides to a lot of defense. Like they Michigan struggles with tempo because they want to do so many things. On the other hand, like if you only do a couple things, then you can be easy to exploit and you don't really have an answer or even like some way to counter that. And again, so like, you know, big picture, like Michigan's in trips that kind of pulls Hickman out of the boundary support, but they put a tight end to the, so- the side, the corner's still there. Now that corner has to provide force support. And and I, I, I don't know a nice way to say Ohio State's corners are not, were not particularly interested in sticking their nose against the run, which I think is going to be a bigger picture issue next year. Um, and, you know, I think they, at some level, it's not their fault. Like the, the way Ohio State had set up the defense, the corners weren't really supposed to be involved. But after Oregon, they had to change things where they needed more of that, and they, it just didn't ever kind of come together. But one of the play calls you highlighted as a particular issue, I always get excited when I see you write about something, and I'm like, oh, we haven't talked about that yet. Good, this is something new for the podcast. Counter OT bash. We have definitely not talked about counter OT <laughs> bash before. So what is that, and why was it such a problem for Ohio State? Well, for everyone who loves the quarterback run game is mad that C.J. Stroud does not run the football. This is what the quarterback run game gets you. So I, Michigan brings in J.J. McCarthy to, to do the quarterback run game, right? And so counter OT bash. Bash just means back sweep. And so backside sweep, essentially. And so they're going to run – the quarterback's going to run the counter play, right? So the counter, counter OT just means the guard's kicking out, the tackle's pulling around, so counter tray. The back, the back is just going to run then away from the play and the quarterback's going to read the backside defender and decide whether to keep it or give on the backside sweep. And I think it just, it encapsulates Ohio State's problems because they struggled both to handle the run game downfield, down, you know, north and south to the boundary and, and handle it laterally to the field because just the way the defense is structured it just it, it, they they did not have numbers to be honest like on either side to be able to handle it and so um you know in theory the way they were playing cover four should help against the quarterback run game but they played in such a way again where they're they still really didn't ever want to involve their corners and their field safety Bryson Shaw in the run game like they still it's like sort of the remnants of the single high right like the concept was always for them to like, we're going to get, we have eight guys basically playing the run and these three guys are past responsibility. And like even playing cover four, they never really changed that, how they did it to the field in terms of into the boundary. And so that that's a lot of their problem. So that kind of touches on something you, you hit. I mean, this, this one made me laugh out loud as I was reading it, really bitterly ironic note that they had done this great job changing the defense on the fly to save the season. And then Saturday, Michigan, they might have been better off running more what they did at the beginning of the year, like all the stuff that saved the season, like that was maybe what the problem was. So can you sort of explain that, you know, you're thinking there? Yeah, I would even go actually more to last year where they were just basically sitting in a cover three shell. I think 
given again, like every opponent is different, but like given Michigan's strengths and how they wanted to play, I would, you know, if they just sat in cover three and you put Hickman up with the line, like you take away Hickman's getting pulled by the RPOs, you now have eight defenders against the run. You can gap out. You just sit in three deep. I mean, ultimately, like what you wanted to do is like what, you know, the, the 30 second answer that anyone would give is like, we want to make Michigan throw the ball a bunch and like throw it downfield. And they, they never got to that point. Michigan got to throw when they wanted to, not when they had to for the most part. And like, so you have to change up the pre-snap look some, but you know, I think at the end of the day, like you, you really wanted to try to like cover every gap, make Michigan pull it and throw it. Maybe they get, you know, killed by RPOs, but I, I guess I think you'd probably rather live that way than, um, you know, it's the converse of the Alabama game. Like mm -hmm. against Alabama, like Alabama killed them with the RPOs because they, but that's the, their strength. Like here, you probably wanted to force them to try to do that. So if you were Ryan Day and you're looking forward now, I mean, obviously the, the status quo is probably not completely acceptable. There's, there's some stuff that is going to have to change, but does the defense need a total overhaul? I mean, they need an outside coordinator to come in, or is this something with, you know, a full off season to make changes? You know, would you think about keeping things more, a little more in house maybe to keep some continuity? Like what, if, if you're Ryan Day, how are you, how are you looking at this defense right now? Yeah, so this is a toughie because a couple of things. So I, I I give Matt Barnes a lot of credit. Like he essentially salvaged this. I I, I think they may have been eight and four if they kept doing what they did. Um, I mean, he the defense massively improved as we've talked about, and that like did happen. Uh, bad matchup. I you know I don't know what Matt Barnes would do with a full off season. I mean I think there'd be a lot of improvements. I think there'd be more variety. Um, but the, you know, but there's also issues in terms of like how the front is played and like how the defensive linemen have gap responsibilities and things like that, that, you know, I think this is, gets to a bigger issue, which is like how wedded is Larry Johnson to doing what he does? And if he's very wedded to that, what do you do if you're Ryan Day? Like, do you take that trade off and try to find someone who can work within what he wants to do? Do you push, I, you know, because most people now are not going to like to compare to what Michigan do. Like, you know, teams are going to kind of like mess with the fronts to like try to gain a gap and a half, do different things. Like Ohio state's like a very traditional four down front still. Um, so these are, these are very tough questions. I, I mean, I think that regardless of whether it's Matt Barnes or someone else, like they need to continue to make like pretty systematic changes in what they're doing and just have like a lot more volume. Um, and um, my guess is that he'll bring in someone new, uh, but I don't know. Is there a name that, you know, what you, you know, someone, someone new is that um, Dave Belk at uh, Houston? Is it Jim Knowles at Oklahoma state? Is there some uh, NFL whiz kid that, that, I mean, did they, did they go the Mike McDonald route and just find the position coach in the NFL? Who's uh, you know, the, the smart guy who's going to, you know, be the next person and no one knows their name right now. Is there, is there a name to you that's, you know, other, other than the obvious Marcus Freeman, is there, is there a, a name that's, you know, jumps out to you or is it kind of just depends on what you want to run? It, I think it depends on what you want to run. So like all the college names you threw at me, like, aren't going to, aren't going to run like, again, like the four down front for the mm -hmm. most part. Like that's definitely not the trend in college football. Like Mike McDonald definitely represents more of the trend. Um, of doing like three down, two down, uh, you know, tight front, mint front, but, you know, Georgia runs. So it, it depends on how much they remain wedded to being a four down front team. I think if they want to do that, the probably the best route is to go get someone from the NFL, again, from the Pete Carroll tree of coaches, you know, from the, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's lots of them out there at this point, you know, from the, the whether it's from Robert Stolla from the Jets or Peter Quinn, um, you know, if if they're open to doing more things, then you can probably get someone in college. I mean, I you know, Hecock from Iowa State would be great. I mean, he's done a lot of innovative things. So I think there's some potential routes. Um, I think it's it's really a question of like, 
if they want to keep the more they want to keep the current structure in place, then maybe it makes more sense to keep Barnes or get someone who, you know, um, like Jeff Halfley essentially mm-hmm. came from that, like Pete Carroll line of coaches. All right. Last thing, and let's go on this one. Same basic question I asked you yesterday. Buckeyes are likely to face a very, very physical offense in the Rose Bowl. If it's, you know, Utah, if it's Oregon, whoever wins that Pac-12 championship game, those are those are two physical offenses. You know, is that a bad matchup for Ohio State at this point? And, you know, is there one of those that would represent a better matchup? And, you know, if would overall, would they rather see that type of team or would they rather see Wake Forest or Pitt, who's going to just try and throw the ball for 7,000 yards on you? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think or, we've, we've seen Oregon, right? That was a bad mm-hmm. matchup. A, a lot of the same reasons that we just talked about with Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I, I would be intrigued to see that just because of seen it before. Um, and, you know, I think probably Utah might be the best matchup just because they're much more just pure run dependent. Um, you know, I, I think I I think a game like against Wake Forest or Pitt would probably be a track meet. Um, and so <laughs> depends what you're in the mood for. Right. But um, again, I think, you know, maybe we'll know more on the coaching front by by the Rose Bowl. I don't know. But it, I think it'd be from my perspective, it would be interesting to see them try it again to play this style of offense and, and see if they have, there have been any improvements. Yeah. Well, if, if the Moorhead to Josh Gaddis thing and you get another crack at Moorhead in the Rose bowl, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe you've, you know, you've, you've come up with a counter punch between uh, here and there. So yeah. 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 And, and, you know, if it's 63 56 against uh, wake forest in the peach bowl or something like, I, I mean, I don't know if it would be a good game, but it would be a fun game. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's never a bad way to end a season. Yeah. So all right. Well, Ross, thank you for joining me. You can find Ross's uh, work at BuckeyeScoop.com. He uh, mentioned this on yesterday's show, but he had the article on Tuesday. You can go back and find that. It is all free content. Great insight. He always puts a lot of GIFs in there, a lot of little short video clips. So you can really see what he's talking about, kind of play it back and forth a few times and get a better understanding for it. So that's all at BuckeyeScoop.com. Make sure you also check out our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash BuckeyeScoop. We have great content there. We do live shows there. We'll have... Uh, pre-game stuff and post-game stuff from the bowl game, all that kind of stuff, all at youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.